Today, we're in week two of our series, The Pursuit of Better. And uh, this is, the, the reason we're calling it this is because, well, the pursuit of perfection is impossible. Yes? Has anybody figured this out already? Have you already figured this out? If you haven't figured, some of, some of you are like, right now, like, oh, I was wondering about that. Yeah, the pursuit of perfection is impossible. But the pursuit of a better always is possible. And that's really what we want to drive into today. I want to welcome you if you're in person or part of our online campus. And I'm so grateful that last song that we were singing, talking about the Holy Spirit. You know, it's the Holy Spirit who works. He is the presence in our life. He is the presence of Christ in our life. He's the presence of God in our life. He's the one that we're experiencing as, uh, as we experience God's presence here in our worship, but also now in our time in the Word. And I would hope that each of us would have ears to hear what the Spirit of God has to say to us. Because as we start this new year, 2024, it's important, it's vitally important that we are here to pursue better. Not just do the same old things, but to pursue better. Amen? Amen. So I don't know if you've ever said something to somebody that didn't come off exactly like you thought. And maybe it went in a very different direction than what you thought it was going to go in. I remember when I was at college, I had a friend, we'll call him Joe. And uh, Joe, well, Joe, Joe wanted to move out of his parents' house. And so he was looking for a way to do this. And so we're around talking one day and he says, I know what I'm going to do. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to move in with Steve. Now, Steve was a friend of ours who was a couple of years older And he was one of these guys who had his life all together. And he had what we would call a real job. (laughs) He had real money. You know, he was actually in his career already. And really, he's just a go-getter. And this guy was meticulous. I mean, he just had the details down. And so Joe said, yeah, I'm I'm gonna gonna just move in with Steve. And And I'm thinking to myself, that's never going to work. And so... In response to that, I said, I said, Joe, come on. You and Steve, that's never going to work. And he said, well, why? And I said, because you're a slob. (laughs) You're a slob. You know you're a slob. That's never going to work. That's just not going to come together. And I thought Joe was going to say, you know what? You're right. I need to up my game if I'm going to move in with Steve, if I'm even going to make that ask of Steve. But he didn't say that at all. He said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? I'm a slob. And not only that, his girlfriend got in on it. I mean, this thing went on for a while. It never got resolved other than they just had to forgive me. But I'm thinking to myself in the moment, because, you know, I had a chance to say a second thing, and I thought better of it. But I'm sitting there thinking, you know, Joe, I'm pretty sure the underwear you're wearing and the socks, you've been wearing them for days. So don't tell me you don't know you're a slob. We all know you're a slob. Your girlfriend knows you're a slob. Steve is not going to go for living with a slob. And by the way, I was right. Steve said, no, I am not living with you whatsoever. Well, our passage today, we're going to find Peter saying something to Jesus that he's pretty sure it's going to go in one direction, but it doesn't go that direction at all. It goes the exact opposite of that direction. Here's our thread. Let's throw that up. The pursuit of perfection isn't possible, but better always is. So before I move on from here, I think we know last week I was a little sick, and you can probably tell I'm still struggling a little bit with uh, a cough. So um, if I have to pause and cough, are we good? Okay, all right, perfect. All right, that'll help me a lot. Here's what I want us to know. God doesn't demand perfection. He doesn't demand perfection but he does ask for your heart. God doesn't demand perfection, but he does desire your heart. And you know, I think about David when he famously found himself far from God. In Psalm 51, the whole incident with Bathsheba, the adultery, the affair, uh, the, the, the murder of Uriah, it was an absolute disaster. It was absolutely horrible. It was absolutely just evil taking over in David's life. So here he is far from God and he is feeling 
the pain of the separation. And he writes in Psalm 51, you do not desire a sacrifice, O God. You see, when he finds himself coming back to God, he says, you don't desire a sacrifice, meaning a, a sacrifice at the temple. It's not what you desire, God, or I'd offer one. You don't want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. Now, he's not saying that, that the sacrifice of the temple was not something that he would do. He's just saying that if I don't bring this heart of sincerity, of brokenness to the Lord and to that sacrifice, that sacrifice is meaningless to God. And you and I know this. And this is how we receive it from other people, yes? If we know it's not sincere, it's not truly from a place of brokenness, then it's difficult, if not impossible, to receive that and find the whole thing resolved. <coughs> when we talk about the heart, we're really talking about who and what I am. Not what I wanna be, but what I am. It's, it's all about the the place that generates my words, it generates my actions, it generates my desires, my feelings, my affections, my passions, my impulses. And you already know you can't offer God perfection from these places. But what you can offer him is your heart in whatever condition it is in today is what he wants you to give him. And then... He wants to go about the work of restoration. And you say, well, I've already done that work, Craig. You don't understand. I, I bowed my knee to Christ years ago. I mean, I, I've offered my life in, in Jesus years ago. I, I realize that. I realize that. But this, this, is, this is not something we do once and then we're done. This is something that we are meant to walk in daily. Here's what, here's what our passage says. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly, this is in Matthew chapter 16. Tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would offer or suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed. But on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. So here Jesus is making his way back to Jerusalem and he's trying to be as clear as he can with his disciples about the why and what that's gonna happen. And you may say, well, that's kind of a strange place for us to start today. Why would we start in this place? Because Jesus is making his way towards Jerusalem and they're about to experience the full range of emotions. They're gonna laugh, they're gonna cry, He's gonna suffer pain. He's gonna suffer the greatest challenges of his life and so will the disciples themselves. It's a full range. And I hate to state the obvious, but we're at the beginning of 2024. You and I are about to experience the full range in this year. Yes? yes. Have we thought about this? And it's better that you and I are pursuing better to be better prepared for what is coming and not just take whatever the day gives us, but to prepare ourselves for the full range that's coming so that we're not thrown off guard. We're not put back on our heels. We're not put in a place where we will step into the trap. And Jesus is gonna use that very word. You see, Jesus is preparing his disciples so that they won't step in the trap. He's preparing them for the hardship. He tells them ahead of time so, so they can prepare for people turning against them because it's gonna happen. He's telling them ahead of time so that they can prepare, and I want you to hear this, for Jesus to overcome because that's the last thing on their mind as they're walking through it. But Jesus is trying to tell them, hello, I'm gonna rise on the third day. I know you heard the part about me being killed, but did you hear the part about me rising on the third day? Did you hear about me rising on the, from the dead? You need to be prepared for me to overcome. And that's the part that so often you and I miss. That's the part so often that we, we just feel like, oh, that day's never gonna come. But that day does come. It comes each and every time. Jesus says, I'm gonna overcome. And then it says, but Peter took him aside. 
So there was a moment for Peter to actually pause, think about his words. And he takes Jesus aside and he began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. So here Peter is trying to, trying to correct Jesus in all this. And yeah, it's not just a knee-jerk reaction like me to my buddy Joe. No, 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 he's had some time to think about it. Jesus finished the conversation. Then he pulls Jesus aside. Jesus, this is never gonna happen. That's not what's gonna go on. You, and he's reprimanding him. You, Peter is trying to work around the pain and the hardship that are about to come. And you and I both get it. I understand why. He doesn't want to walk through it. And he doesn't want to see Jesus walk through it either. None of us want to see our friends, the people that we love and care about, our spouses, our children. We don't want to see them walk through these difficult things, these things that we can see coming. But in 2024, we're going to be in this place. We're going to be in this place. And so I understand why, why Peter would be, would be, in the place where he wants to do it. So we all understand why. But Jesus told them this so that they wouldn't run from it. That's so important that we would get that. Not so that they would be in denial. Not that they would run as fast as they could away from it. No, no, so that they could trust him and that they could embrace the, the, the hardship and the exhilaration of walking with Jesus because they're about to experience the full range of emotion. But here he is asking them, and it's gonna be some time. It's not gonna happen within days that they're gonna get to Jerusalem. It's gonna take them months to get there. And he's saying, I need you to trust me. I want all of us to hear Jesus saying to us today, I need you to trust me. Jesus is saying that to you. I need you to trust me. I need you to trust me. There's gonna be some hardships. There's gonna be some challenges and we're gonna laugh our heads off too. But I need you to trust me. Jesus turned to Peter and this is what, this is what Peter didn't expect to happen at all. He's thinking, Jesus is gonna say, oh, Peter, you're such a good friend. Oh, oh, I just wish the other, other 11 would get it. Man, you're the only one. You get me. Thank you. That's not exactly what Jesus does. <laughs> it says, Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan, deceiver liar, distorter of truth is what that means. <laughs> you are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. The truth is Jesus had to go to the cross or no one was gonna get rescued. And so, so the last thing Jesus needs right now is a pass or, or an excuse to be able to get out of doing the very thing he has to do for the sake of others. There are some hardships you and I just have to endure. We have to walk through them. And by the way, we were built for this. So stop thinking that you're not. We live in a generation that has forgotten that we are way stronger than we truly are. We, we think we're so weak, but no, we are not. We are strong and we are stronger when we are walking with Christ. Hardship is, is gonna have to be endured. People will not always walk with you through pain or, 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 or with you in your hour of trial. It's not always gonna happen. I, I was so elated to hear one of our single moms here at our church talking about recently <coughs> that she, she has come to learn and to understand that as difficult as parenting is, that when she walks with Christ, she recognizes she is not alone in these difficult decisions. 
when she walks with Christ, that they are parenting together. This is something that they get to do together. You and I are never alone, which is why Jesus would say famously, hello, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So when you think I did, you need to look again because I'm right there with you. If you're here today and you're thinking, I'm all alone. No, you're not. You're not. Jesus is with you, one. And secondly, you are in a church And a church is a community that is here to cheerlead you on and to help you as much as we can. There's much we can't do. Jesus can do that work. The things that we can do, we want to do. And we are meant, as Jesus is challenging Peter, to hold on to God's heart and to let go of ours. Hold on to God's heart and to let go of ours. Remember, let's remember that the heart is who and what I am. It generates the words. It generates the actions. It's all about the the seat of desires and affections and passions and impulses of feelings of my life. And I can't offer God perfection in these things, but I can offer him my heart. I'm not chasing perfection. I'm chasing better so that I can find restoration And I'm still in a place of restoration. All of us are still in a place of restoration. Yes? Yes. So then then Jesus feels the need to come to his disciples after this side conversation with Peter. So whether they heard this or not, I don't think they heard Peter, but I think they heard Jesus calling him Satan. They're probably like, what did he say now? Guy is an idiot. Ugh. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to be my follower, they're like, oh, great. So Peter goes and talks to him, and now he's going to have to come back to all of us. Great. This is one of those moments where, where, where it generates a talking to, to all of us. Jesus says to his disciples, if any one of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, oh, you'll save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is there anything worth more than your soul? Hey, no apologies. He just lets it stand. Put a period on it. We're good. We need to understand that following Jesus is is not living a balanced life. Do we know this? As we're entering 2024 and we're thinking, we're talking, we're challenging ourselves to better, the pursuit of better, we need to understand that, 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 that this is not a balanced life. There is no balance when it comes to a cross, it is all or it's nothing. That is the picture that Jesus puts out for us. It's about being a specialist, not a generalist, as many people are trying to make work in their life and recognizing the failure in it. It's not about being a generalist walking at the side of Christ. It's about being a specialist at walking at the side of Christ, everything literally centered around Christ. Like, wait, it sounds like what you're trying to say is that everything in my life, like all of it, whatever topic I come up with, is is somehow pointed toward Christ, somehow working around like he's in the middle of this circle and everything's looking inward to Christ and is influenced by that. It sounds like that's what you're saying. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. And when we look at our life and we're looking at 2024 and you don't know everything, but here's what I do know. You know what better looks like. Oh, you can't chase perfection, but you can chase better. There's nothing balanced about the cross. 
It's a place of surrender where I bring all of me. You know, at this point in time, let's just think about what they knew of the cross. First of all, they didn't know anything about the cross as far as what we do. The resurrection, the death on the cross, Jesus the sacrificial lamb, none of this made any sense to them. This was not even on their radar whatsoever. So when Jesus is talking about the cross in this context, he is saying, hey, you guys all know what the cross is. The Roman cross is where we go to die. That's where you go to die. You go to die at the cross. That's that's what that's all about. And so when Jesus says, hey, you need to pick up your cross and follow me because they would make the, the, the prisoners carry their crosses. Hey, you need to pick up your instrument of death, the thing that you are eventually going to die on. And so we're recognizing it. Jesus is, is, is likening the cross to an altar, to an altar and where I would offer myself on it in honor to God who would, and I want you to think about this, who would even give me the right to approach that altar in the first place. Because I have no right to even approach the altar of God. Have you ever thought about that? You don't even have a right to approach that altar. But Jesus gives us the right, the invitation and the mercy of God. We receive that invitation to approach the altar of God and then to offer ourselves on it. That's why Romans 12, one and two says, I plead with you, I plead with you, he says, the people of Rome, the church at Rome, give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. Not that you think is acceptable. Not that your friends would say, okay, that was pretty good. That was good enough. No, no, no. Their perspective doesn't even matter. I mean, literally, who cares? But the kind that he would find acceptable This is truly, it says, the way to worship him. So don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, are we? Don't don't do that. Let God transform you into a new person. You're gonna bring the heart that you have. Oh, it's really who you are. It's not who he originally created you to be. He wants you to be restored to that original version of yourself. He wants to transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. And then you will learn to know God's will for you because that's what it takes, which is good and it's pleasing and it's perfect. That's the perfection we pursue is the perfect will of God, the perfection of God's will for my life. It's an exchange that takes place At this altar, it is my heart for his. And this is not a discipline that I implement in my life. That's not what this is. This is is a laying down of those things that are in me and that are of me, that stand in the way of me living my life at the side of Christ, whether it's at my home or my job site or in my classrooms. Wherever you find yourself, what is standing in the way? Well, you can lay that down at that altar and then pick it up in exchange for what God actually has for you. Nothing's being held back. I love this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, we're going back through it. If anyone wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. What does he mean by that? Well, the way is pretty obvious. It's just a path. It's a road. It's a trail. It's, 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 it's something that you're on to get from one place to another place. And he says, you're going to have to give up your own way. I know you got your own GPS, but you really need to follow mine. I've, I've got it. I've got this. I got, and this isn't, by the way, about getting you there in the quickest time possible. So let's just all right, let's take that off the plate. That's not what we're doing but I am about trying to get you to the right place. And that's where my GPS is gonna take you. 
And so as we listen to his way, we recognize that, but we have to give up our way. Oh, I, Jesus is really saying things like, oh, I know that you want your job to fulfill you and to give you purpose in life, but that's not actually what's gonna happen. I know you want your spouse to meet all your emotional needs, but that isn't actually possible. I know that you want your accomplishments to be applauded and they're gonna satisfy your soul and you're, gonna, you're, you're, gonna, you're just gonna rest in them and glory in them and it's not gonna feel that way at all. Entertainment, it should be way more than just momentary distractions. Yeah, but it won't be because it just isn't. Addictions to soothe the broken places of my heart and my mind, but that's not what they do they actually break us more. So Jesus says, you need to give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. I want you to die to those things. Exchange those things for me. Follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you're gonna lose it. Your way does not deliver. What is Jesus asking? He's saying, I need you to trust me. I need you to trust me. Is this making sense to us, church? 2024 is the full range of emotions, and we're not chasing perfection, but we are chasing better, and Jesus is asking us to trust him. Jesus said, if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it, because when we walk at the side of Christ, we experience the kingdom of God in all its fullness, in all its glory, in all its wonder, in all its power, And that's where joy, that's where satisfaction are going to be found for us. And, uh, you know, many assume that this is not a conversation that we need to have with Christian people. Like, oh, no, hey, come on, man, what what are you talking about? Jesus is having this with Christian people. The most elite Christian followers, Jesus followers on the planet at the moment. He's having this conversation with them. So Jesus is having this conversation with the apostles themselves. Why do I somehow think that maybe this isn't for me? I think it is for me. In fact, I'm positive it's for me. And and I do acknowledge this, this passage is not so much a teaching as much as it is a call to examine. It's it's a call to assess. It's a call to intentionality. As we would enter 2024 and, you know, we've kind of gotten past the New Year's resolutions. And I agree with Pastor Justin. He did an amazing job, by the way, with his message a few weeks ago as well. And as he was talking about the, the, the role of, of uh, New Year's resolutions, um, I have been reading along with you guys and the one-year Bible because of it, by the way. So thanks for the challenge, Pastor Justin. Uh, I love that. Decided I was gonna do something new that way this year. But those are good things. But now the dust has settled and the people stop going to the gym now. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about? They're like, I am strong for two and a half days. Now I'm just sore. (laughs) It's like they go to the gym now for the massage machines instead of the weights. (laughs) Instead of the the stair climbers, you know. It's gut check time. It's time for us to assess it. It's time for us to to ask ourselves, what what are we doing with this relationship? What am I doing with this relationship with God? What what do I want from this relationship with God? I don't want to just let the next day happen. I don't want to just let today happen. This isn't a gimme. What are you going to do? I'm going to go to church. I'm going to watch some football, and that's it. What if God wants to speak to you something so profound today that it alters the course of your life? That conversation could happen today. Do you know that? Are we even prepared to, to be available for that conversation? What do we want from the relationship And why do we want it? And how are we gonna get it? All these are great questions for us to look at. You know, Becky and I just celebrated 33 years 
of Marriage at January 4th. <clears throat> and you know, the, you can't get to 33 years without having some serious conversations. Do you know what I mean? Anybody? 33 years or longer? Anybody? Okay. You know as well as I do, you can't get there unless you've had some very serious conversations. There are times when you have to ask the questions again. You gotta come back to them. You gotta make sure you're on the same page. You gotta make sure that the two of you are still in sync, and that you both are chasing the same things. Many of us do these things at the appropriate moments, but many of us actually don't. We actually don't. It's been too long, and we do it we, we probably stay away from it maybe because we feel like we're pursuing perfection and we know that's impossible. We've already blown that so badly. There's just no, not even a point. We get it. So let's just take that off the table because that isn't on the table. Never was. Perfection is not what we're pursuing, but better is. I know you won't know everything, but what do you know? A couple of quick things here and then we're gonna pray. So what are you prepared to do? What are you prepared to stop? What are you prepared to start? What are you prepared to hold on to in faith? And what are you prepared to sacrifice in order to get what you want? What are you prepared to sacrifice? Now, I know you won't know everything, but you know, you know some things. Yes? Yes. We know some things. So what are you prepared to stop? What are you prepared to start? Hold on to in faith. Didn't happen in 23, but you know, God does want to accomplish it in 24. What are you prepared to sacrifice? Like, oh, I don't like that word, Craig. Sacrifice, that sounds a little painful. <laughs> and all the good you want is on the other side of that. All the good you want is on the other side of that act of obedience. It's a new year. It's time to take an honest look at the heart and everything coming out of it. What if 2024 was about the pursuit of a better, a better heart, honoring God with my heart? It's time to question these key areas in my life. And we start with heart. Last week, Pastor Tim started with the habits in our life that could help us. Many of those are things that we could start in our life. If you missed it, you need to go back to it. But I also wanted to say this to us because so often when people think about church, they have the wrong image in their mind. And I just wanna make sure, because I can't change that image for everybody, but I can help bring clarity to that image for us. Heights Church is not here for you. We've been saying this from day one and we're still saying it now at year 15. Heights Church is not here for you to come, sit, listen, sing, tip, and leave. This isn't a place that you just attend. This place should be, could be, meant to be so much more than that. This is a place that will help you meet the challenge. This is your walk with Jesus, and I can't want it more than you do. Amen. It's your walk with Jesus. It's gonna be what you make it. I will tell you, and I'm not saying this, I'm not saying this because I'm like trying to put a knife in. I'm just gonna tell you about my walk with Jesus in the midst of this world that is falling apart is awesome. My walk with Jesus is awesome. Because it can be. And I'm willing to make the sacrifices for it. I'm willing to stop. I'm willing to start. I'm willing to hold on to faith. And I'm not perfect in these things, but I am pursuing better. And I want you to know, this is not about getting by. This is about awesome and experiencing the kingdom of God in the midst of, yeah, this big crap sandwich we live in. Yeah, I think we can clap louder for that. 
Heights Church exists to help you experience God. Everything we do is to help you to follow through on your desire to follow Jesus. That's why we do and we gather in these weekend services. Don't miss. In a day and age where people are running from church, run to it. Because eventually they're gonna figure it out. And you'll just be able to say, welcome home. Run to it. It's time to make it the center of your life because it was always meant to be. Because this is the place that wants what you want your life in Jesus. It's why we gather on the weekends. It's why we gather in our life groups. It's why we gather with our life group labs and our restoration ministries. And we offer to stand in the presence of God with one another in prayer and to offer our faith for one another. It's why we do this. I'm not just here to stand next to you in a service and sing terribly. Um, By the way, some of you are really bad. But I love you anyway. I sit where I sit for a reason. <laughs> That's not true. I was just kidding. That's why we encourage personal connections because none of us were meant to do this alone. And so let's make this the year. Do it. Let's make this happen. 2024 is going to offer you a lot. It's the full gamut, full reasons, all kinds of reasons to quit, opportunities to impact. Let's prepare. Let's be prepared for all of it. And I want you to know recently, I was at the altar. I had to go sit with God. I had to go pick up that cross of mine again. Say, God, it's time to stop. It's time to start. It's time to hold on to some things in faith. It's time to sacrifice. And awesome was waiting on the other side for me. Amen. Amen. It's what Jesus challenges us to. It's what I offer you today. So as we go to prayer, here's the challenge. What better is God calling you to? What does better look like for you? There's something. You don't know everything. You don't have to. <laughs> you really shouldn't. But you know what the next things are. What are you going to stop? What are you going to start? What are you going to hold on to in faith? And what are you going to sacrifice so you can get what you want in Christ? Father, as we come before you today, the phrase thank you (laughs) just resounds in me. Thank you for being so good. Thank you for being so clear. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for telling Peter exactly what he didn't want to hear because it is what I needed to hear. You weren't looking to get out of the challenge in front of you. Lord, you were You were wanting to make sure that you didn't step into the trap and you didn't. The Lord... I pray that as we're coming to this point in time here at the beginning of our year, Lord, we do want to prepare for better. We want to pursue better. Perfection's off the table. And truly, some of us need to sit with you on that phrase alone and let you speak to us so that we'll believe you. And I pray, Lord, that we could get past that and that we could pursue better. So, Lord, in this moment, as we have been engaging with your presence, your Holy Spirit this whole time, Lord, you're here for us in this moment to give us exactly what we need. You're the one who's been putting your finger on a number of things. And so now it's our time to offer our faith. I'm wondering if you're here today and you say, you know what? Yeah, I know something. I don't know everything, but I know something. And in faith, yeah, I'm saying yes to God. 
We don't have a long time. We don't need a long time. Decisions in your hands. I can't want it more than you do. If your answer is a yes and you're gonna offer your faith to God, just lift a hand right now and say, oh yeah. Just lift your hand right now as a way of saying, oh yeah, God. Oh yeah. Get him up high. Get him up high. You can be proud. We're offering a faith. We're in agreement with Jesus. I don't know why I would be ashamed of that or lack confidence with that. No, 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 no. If you're a part of the online church, I want you to just drop it in the, in the chat right now. That's me. That's me. Your Father, you see our hands and you know what this is about. There's something to stop, there's something to start, there's something to sacrifice, there's something to hold on in faith for. Your Father, I exercise my faith for those things right now as I would say yes to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And there's someone here today, maybe part of our online campus, if you're here and you say, you know what, today's the day that I'm gonna give my heart to Christ. I wanna be that follower of Christ. I am gonna pick up my cross. I'm gonna follow him. I'm gonna give up my life for his. If that's you, there's a link, drop it in the chat right now. I want you to click that as an act of faith. Follow that. That's you. Follow that. If you're part of us here in person and you say, you know what, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm exchanging my life for his today. That's what I'm doing. Anybody here to my right with an uplifted hand and say, yeah, that's me. Anybody here over to my left? You say, that's me. That's me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming across the middle. Yeah, yeah. Anybody over here? Yeah, yeah. Over here. Yeah, yeah. Amen. That's awesome. God, this is something to celebrate. We thank you, God, as your church. People. But to recognize how good you are and say yes to you. If you raise your hand, this is the intention of your heart, online or in person. I just want you to repeat this prayer after me in your heart. Oh God, I thank you. I thank you for offering me the invitation to come to your altar, an altar I don't deserve to be at. But you bring me anyway. I ask for your forgiveness. Those things that I have famously done far from you. I want to be near you, with you, not separated from you. Will you forgive me, oh God, of my sin? And I hear you say yes, and I recognize that, that healing and that forgiveness is now a gift that I'm receiving. Thank you, oh God, for that. And not only that, but the cleansing of my mind and my heart, it's begun. And I'm grateful for that, oh God. And I'm thankful that your Holy Spirit resides in me today, as your Bible would say, as your Holy Scriptures would tell us, that your, your Holy Spirit has been given to us as a deposit of eternity to come. And so God, we know that you are with us and you will never leave us nor forsake us. And now this incredible gift of eternal life is mine. And I embrace it and I hold on to it with every grateful fiber of my being. And I pray it all in the mighty name of Jesus. If we agree with the prayer, can we say amen together? Yeah. Amen and amen. Giving is one of the greatest joys that you and I can experience in life. And I love how we are promised in scripture in the book of Luke, that our gift will return to us in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. It actually says running over. And that's the awesome reason why you can step into giving here at Heights Church. And by supporting Heights Church, you and I have the privilege of stepping into the miraculous work that God is doing in the lives of others. I mean, when we think about it, God is our great provider. He has given us everything that we need. And we get to give a portion of that back so that miraculous work will continue in the lives of others. By giving to support Heights Church, you are actually helping to provide many wonderful opportunities, such as creating a safe place for our kids to learn about Jesus. Yes, and bringing students a sense of purpose and belonging through all of our student ministries that we offer here at Heights Church. We get to see people's spirits lifted higher as they engage in our Sunday worship service, either at part of our online campus or here in person. We're actually watching God's word come alive as we learn about its meaning for us today in our Sunday messages. And also we get to open doors for meaningful connections and friendships through our life groups. 
and we're touching lives overwhelmed by fear, by grief, by addiction and hopelessness, and we are helping to transform them and helping people to experience peace, hope, and joy through the Restoration Ministries. You and I can leave a legacy literally for eternity as, as we see lives changed forever through the church. Will you pray about what God would have you give today? I know that he wants to bring the joy of giving into your life and see lives transformed through you.